Good evening, everybody. You're all very, very welcome to the Hawkesfield Theatre tonight. It's fantastic to see such a full house, and you're all very, very welcome, as I say, on behalf of Sligo County Council for this decade event in our Decade of Centenaries programme, exploring the Civil War in Sligo. It's supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Scale Health, Sports and Media under the Decade of Centenaries initiative. And yes, I did have to write that down so I'd remember all the names. And it's also a celebration of Sligo Library and the Local Studies and Archives facility, which is open every day for, for you to peruse and to find out more information about what you hear about this evening. And you have all, you've noticed your fire exit, so I needn't man manage that to you at all. So really, I'm going to get straight down to business and say that we have a fantastic evening ahead of us. We have four speakers, and we have a really contrasting width of knowledge and experience in the areas that they're going to be talking about. And each of them has a unique Sligo connection, which they'll be talking about in the context of the Civil War. And Michelle and I will introduce you to them, or even them to you, as the night goes on. But first of all, I would like to invite the Cahirlock to say a few words. Cahirlock. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fellow councillors, uh, Casserly, Walsh and Gilroy, if you know anything about councillors, they like to hear their names being called out, so <laughs> I have to keep in with them. Members of Sligo County Council Executive, guest speakers and distinguished guests that I see in front of me and friends. I'm so honored and privileged to be the Cahirlock of Sligo County Council in this time when we commemorate the centenary of the Civil War. I have great interest in this period myself and I'm very proud that my family were so much involved in this period through my aunt, great aunt, Lindy Kearns, and my father's first cousin, Tommy Goff, who was shot in Beltre on the 23rd of February, 1923. They were so much involved in this period, and I'm so proud of that. We owe a great sense of gratitude to the historians and other academics who study the major issues of the past, of our past, and offer their unique perspective on the events that shaped our history. And the, and the recent commemoration ceremony in Bail of Law showed that the passage of time can cause us to revisit these events, consider new narratives, and question old certainties. The, the centenary of the Civil War offers a unique opportunity to examine those events that impact so many families so many communities in every part of the country. It could be argued that 100 years on provides sufficient distance to consider these events in the political and social context of their time. The lectures this evening will inform, inspire and provoke and I would like to think formally and I would like to thank and formally commend our four historians for their knowledge and their expertise and sharing that with us this evening. A special word of thanks to our Liberian, County Liberian, Donald Tenney, and his outstanding manage, management of the Decades of Centenary Programme. And to our ex Executive Liberian, Pat Gammon, Gannon, for his exemplary work in arranging this evening event. So I hope you'll all enjoy, enjoy the evening. I certainly will. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that, Cahirlock of Sligo County Council, Councillor Michael Clark. As I mentioned, we have four speakers tonight, and just to let you know, there will be a break after the second speaker. But before that, I'm going to introduce you to Michelle Cashman, librarian from the Local Studies and Archives in Bridge Street, who is going to introduce us to a short film piece. Michelle. Good evening, everybody. We're now going to view a Pathé newsreel that was shot in Sligo on the 16th of April, 1922. This film recorded the events leading up to and including a political meeting addressed by Arthur Griffith and other politicians on behalf of the pro-treaty provisional government. The Anglo-Irish treaty negotiations were finalized in London on the 6th of December, 1921. The Dáil ratified the treaty 
on the 7th of January, 1922. 64 votes in favour, 57 against. Following the treaty, elections were to be held to elect a new government, scheduled for the 16th of June, 1922. The treaty brought into being the provisional government, headed by Arthur Griffith. Both pro and anti-treaty members of the Dáil contested the election. It was a fight for public approval of one side or the other, determined by the vote. Enjoy the short film of Sligo in 1922. Arthur Griffith held a series of election meetings around the country. One was scheduled in Sligo for Easter Sunday, the 16th of April. This was promptly prohibited by the anti-treaty divisional commander of the Sligo area, General Liam Pilkington. To thwart the arrival of Griffith and his supporters, anti-treaty forces blocked roads leading to Sligo. Anti-treaty forces occupied many of the public buildings in Sligo, including the Imperial Hotel, now known as Lola's Nightclub. The courthouse the town hall. Pro-treaty forces patrolled Castle Street while the meeting took place on the corner of Grattan Street and O'Connell Street. John Street Grattan Street The speakers meet at the Mayor of Sligo, Dudley M. Hanley's house in Old Market Street with the smiling Arthur Griffith in election mode.
Now, I always think that's a, a fascinating piece of archive. We showed it this morning to this theatre was full of secondary school students. I think they're all really struck about these are streets that they know and they're looking at them 100 years ago in a completely different context. I don't know about you, but when I'm walking home tonight or walking to the car, it just makes you stop and think for a minute, these kind of evenings or these pieces of history that you can see recorded of places you walk by and take for granted and just think about the history and the people that went before you and the impact it's had on them or on you. Anyway, you didn't come here to listen to me tonight. I'm going to straight in now and introduce you to Dr. Michael Farry. He's the author of The Irish Revolution, Sligo, 1912 to 1923. He's going to give an overview of the events around the onset of the Civil War in 1922 and how it impacted Sligo. Michael is from Sligo himself, and not only is he an historian, he is also a poet, so I'm sure he's going to give us some very interesting and thought-provoking perspectives. Michael. Thanks very much to uh, all those who organised this. I'm delighted to be here. This is a brief account of the course of the Civil War in County Sligo. It's the narrative, maybe the boring part. But one of the really interesting things about the Civil War in County Sligo is this comparison of the activity in Sligo during the War of Independence and during the Civil War. And one way of looking at that is by looking at the total number of deaths within County Sligo for both of those periods. And as you can see there, the total in the War of Independence is in or around 16. Of those, one is a civilian who shot as a spy by the IRA. No IRA killed within County Sligo. 14 Crown Forces killed in action, one accidental. And that's a total of 15 Crown Forces. Most of those are members of the RIC. So a total of 16. On the other hand, in the Civil War, 52 people were killed. Some of those were accidentally killed. 24 members of the National Army were killed. Seven of those were accidental deaths. 17 anti-treaty soldiers, who I'll call IRA from now on, were killed and there was 11 civilians. Two of those were shot as spies by the IRA. The others died accidentally in crossfire and so on. The, the, the picture on the top is of some IRA guerrillas from South Sligo. The map is of positions for the Cliffany ambush in North Sligo. In Sligo, the War of Independence had seen three or four IRA ambushes on Crown Forces, which result, resulted in Crown Force deaths, and a few unsuccessful attacks on police barracks. It did see two impressive prison rescues from Sligo Jail in 1920 and 1921. IRA headquarters had repeatedly complained to Sligo Brigade during early 1921 of lack of activity, unacknowledged dispatches, unanswered queries and unsatisfactory reports. In fact, Michael Collins was complaining about handwriting from Sligo. And in their turn, Sligo Brigade complained to headquarters about lack of support as regard arms. And they also mentioned the number of um, Crown Forces stationed in Sligo as one of the reasons for their apparent lack of activity. And this is, this is um, a pattern you see now and then in those times, and maybe often, of the periphery against the centre. The centre complaining about the periphery not being active enough, the periphery, which in this case we call Sligo, complaining that they're not getting enough support from the centre. Uh, the Doyle Air and Counter State, on the other hand, did operate to a significant extent in the county. This is the iconic photograph by Kilgannon of the first um, county council, the first Republican county council, June 1920. The empty chair is for Frank Carty, who was in jail. These um, bodies, the county council, the corporation, did recognise an attempt to operate under Doyle Aaron. They also established a network of Doyle courts, and British courts were generally boycotted. The IRA assisted in doing police duty, collecting rates, and even dog licenses. 
When the War of Independence ended with the truce on the 11th of July 1921, some prominent IRA leaders, like the OC of Sligo Brigade, Liam Pilkington, was, were free. Frank Carty from South Sligo and Seamus Devins from North Sligo were TDs, so they were released very soon in early August with all the Sinn Féin TDs. During the truce period, July to December 1921, they and other IRA members were very prominent in public. They were honoured guests at public events, and they very often posed for the camera. And many of these photographs, and photographs like this, were probably taken during that time. Possibly not all of them, but many of them were. So the IRA were un unhindered in their control of the county. And that summer in early autumn saw large numbers of IRA, many of them new recruits, take part in at least 16 training camps all over County Sligo. So a large number of recruits, a large number of IRA people were trained. The RIC and the British Army, who were still in situ, could do absolutely nothing but look on. The 3rd Western Division of the IRA hadn't been organised before this. It was one of the last to be organised. It was organised towards the end of the truce period. It covered all of County Sligo and some neighbouring parts of Leitrim, Roscommon and Mayo. Its officers came exclusively, almost exclusively, from Sligo Brigade, with the exception of Brian McNeil from uh, Dublin. Liam Pilkington was appointed the OC of the division. During that period, Sligo IRA seemed to claim full credit for what they regarded as the victory in the War of Independence. The RIC County Inspector in a report said the IRA leaders believe, that's the ones in Sligo, there will be peace and take to themselves the entire credit of same. Seamus Devon said it was the Irish Army, the IRA, that brought the Irish question to what it was today and it was the army who would carry them to success in the end. Now, others on the Sinn Féin side did not agree, and there was tension between those who considered themselves as soldiers first, the IRA, and those who thought of themselves as Republican and Sinn Féin, but as politicians, especially county councillors. Sligo IRA continually interfered in the operation of the county council and other local bodies during the, during the, the truce period. And at one stage, an inspector from Doyle, Aaron, who was in Sligo, reported back saying, Sligo Brigade appears to have declared martial law for Sligo because they were ordering the county council uh, what to do. So by the end of, and there was also rivalry between some of the IRA leaders themselves, especially between Frank Carty in South Sligo and Liam Pilkington, who was technically, and only technically, his superior officer. So by the end of 1921, the IRA in Sligo were in a strong position as regards arms and training, but they had also created numerous enemies who, when the opportunity came, were more than willing to oppose them. And of course, that opportunity came with the treaty. Public bodies and newspapers in Sligo, as elsewhere, generally declared support for the treaty. Though Sligo was unusual that one of the local newspapers was anti-treaty, and this was the Connacht Man, edited by a Tipperary native, a blow-in, R.G. Bradshaw. Most, but not all, of the Sligo IRA leaders took the anti-treaty side, and they occupied the local barracks as the RIC and the British military vacated them after the treaty in early 1922. The following six months then saw escalating tension between the opposing sides, nationally and locally in Sligo as divisions hardened and the battle lines were clearly drawn. Pilkington was deeply involved in the National Anti-Treaty Executive all through this period and a subsequent civil war. And this is Griffith's meeting, Sligo, April 1922, an election meeting in which the opposing sides faced each other in Sligo. There was even some gunshots uh, exchanged, but the meeting went on peacefully. And that was seen as a victory for the treaty side. And it also allowed the new National Army to establish posts in Sligo Town to challenge the existing anti-treaty posts. The National Army posts were in the jail and in the courthouse. They also had posts in Markree Castle near Colooney, in the market house in Colooney, in Ballymote and in Gurchie. 
In spite of all the clear warning signs that there was going to be a civil war, Sligo IRA, as indeed the IRA elsewhere, developed no clear strategy for action at the outbreak of war. The war started, as we know, 28th of June 1922 in Dublin, and when news of the start of the Civil War reached Sligo, the 3rd Western Division staff met. Carty advocated immediate offensive action against government posts in the area, including in Sligo Town. Liam Pilkington and most of the divisional staff opposed this, and in Sligo Town, the IRA did not take the initiative. The government troops in the courthouse, in fact, made the first move by taking over the building. It was a garage at the time, later Williams Garage, uh, which was beside their post and which directly faced the former RIC barracks, where the Garda barracks is now, which was occupied by the IRA. So it looked like there was going to be war between those two there. But early on Saturday, the 1st of July, the um, IRA abandoned that barracks burned it, abandoned their other barracks in, in Wine Street as well, and joined their comrades in the military barracks in the north of the, of the town. The following morning, they excavated, or they evacuated. I've been thinking of archaeology for some reason. <laughs> the following morning, they evacuated and burned that and established a new headquarters at Rahali House near Lissadell. So they left Sligo Town. Frank Carty's group to the south of Sligo captured the government post at Colooney Market House and established a headquarters there. They sniped at the Markree Castle government post and killed a soldier, but failed to take it. They also attacked Gurchin Post and failed to take that. The government's grip on Sligo Town was far from secure, of course, and there were clashes and sniping over the following days. Government reinforcements, including the Ballinalee armoured car, arrived in Sligo on the 5th of July. The Ballon Lee was the Rolls-Royce armoured car which had been in Sligo for Griffith's meeting and it's used on all the posters there, that iconic image. It came back again in, to Sligo on the 5th of July. It was used to maintain communications between Sligo and Markery Castle by the back road by Lock Hill. And on 13th of July, it was ambushed at... Sometimes it's called Dooney Rock, sometimes it's called Rockwood, on the shores of Loch Gill. Four of the National Army soldiers were killed before they surrendered. The Balna Lee managed to escape that, but it immediately ran into another IRA roadblock and it was captured and taken to Rahali. And that picture was taken at Rahali. And they've attempted to rename it the Loch Gill instead of Balna Lee. People think the Loch Gill plate there came from one of the Sligo Leitrim uh, trains. The following day, the IRA took the Balnalee into Sligo Town and delivered an ultimatum to the National Army garrison in the courthouse. It refused to surrender. Bishop Coyne, the Catholic Bishop of Elphin, arrived in to mediate. And that picture on the left-hand side, I think both pictures probably show him negotiating with Tom Scanlon, who was the IRA leader there. They didn't come to any agreement. So Bishop Coyne went to the courthouse and sat in the courthouse, refused to move. Tom Scanlon later recalled to Ernie O'Malley, realising the propaganda the enemy would make of it, if the bishop was either killed or wounded by our, our attack, we left the town with all our men. On that same night, um, Sean McKeown, he was the man with the axe in the film you saw earlier. He had been in Sligo for Griffith's meeting as well. He was OC of the Western Command. He took a troop train of between three and 400 men from Athlone and surrounded Colooney. And after a long battle, the um, town was taken and many of the IRA there were captured. On the 28th of July, government forces occupied Tubbercurry, and then all the towns in Sligo were in government hands. So the first phase, you could say, of the civil war in Sligo was over. The IRA had adopted the familiar guerrilla tactics, and they did control much of the countryside, which in many cases, it was suitable terrain for guerrillas to operate. 
The aim of the government had been expressed as to prevent enemy troops evacuating barracks in possession of rifles and ammunition and reverting to guerrilla warfare. And in that, they failed. And that meant that a decisive victory would be difficult. The army was just was a, a, in its infancy and it was just being built up. This time the enemy wasn't foreign, it was native. The people were war weary and the new government and its army could claim a democratic mandate following the June 1922 election. But neither side was strong enough at this stage to defeat the other. In early August, the National Army Intelligence reported that the IRA and Sligo were based in, mainly in three areas. The divisional staff at Rahali House in North Sligo, 100 to 120 men with 90 rifles, seven revolvers, four machine guns, and of course an armoured car. Frank Harty had a group which was, they estimated at between 40 and 60. Uh, they operated along the Ox Mountains from Kulani to Curry. In the Giva and Arigna area on the sligo riscommon border, a party led by Ned Bofin was estimated at 150. And they also had a plentiful supply of rifles and revolvers. They also reported a small group of about 13 rifles and revolvers operating around ballymote Gurchin area. The IRA did operate outside those areas, of course. There were friendly houses all over the county, including in towns such as Sligo and IRA members could move there with relative ease, especially during the early part of the war. There was also a network of supporters, especially women, who carried out vital services. And this is Maria Marin, niece Stenson of Bonanadon. And there's an extract from her pension application there on the left. And she gives her service as including general secret service work, collecting funds for flying columns, arranging sleeping quarters, caring for arms and ammunition in dugout on my father's land. The IRA still had the Balna Lee, and it was used in attacks on National Army posts at Sligo, Drumahair, Manor Hamilton and Bundorn. Early in September, Frank Carty used it to attack government posts in Tubbercurry and Ballymote. The picture on the right, that's Frank Carty, there's the Balna Lee, and that's supposed to be in Tubbercurry. The 4th Western Division used it to take Ballina on the 12th of September, but then it retreated from Ballina before the advance of a large National Army convoy under Tony Lawler. After they took Ballina, this convoy joined with troops under Sean McKeown with his own armoured car and moved along the Ox Mountains towards Tabakuri and on to Sligo. McKeown and Lawler then turned their attention to North Sligo. They launched a coordinated encircling attack on the 19th of September. Very well planned, but the weather was very bad, and all the plans were upset. Many of the IRA slipped through the National Army cordon to the safety of the mountains on the sligo leitrim border. The Ballon Lee was taken back by the National Army. But before the IRA left it, they put it out of action, so it was going to be useless to the National Army. It's interesting that you can see uh, some of the graffiti that the National Army wrote on it. It includes what I read as vengeance for Dooney Rock on the left-hand side, remembering the ambush at Dooney Rock or Rockwood. It was during this operation then that the six IRA, Seamus Devins, Brian McNeil, Paddy Carroll, Harry Benson, Joseph Banks and Tommy Langan were killed on the Benbulban Mountains. And there, as we know, Sligo's noble six died on the 20th of September and were widely commemorated this week in various ways. Um, all except McNeil were Sligo people. McNeil was, as we know, the son of Owen McNeil, the government minister. And both he and Paddy Carroll of Sligo had brothers in the National Army. And there's no doubt but that these six men were shot after they surrendered or were captured. These deaths and the capture of other activists at this time were serious setbacks for the IRA in the area and it took some time to recover. <coughs> but the National Army was unable to take full advantage of this lull in activity. Their Western Command covered an area from Longford 
to the West Coast, and there were problems with morale, organization, pay, supplies, and equipment. For instance, officers in the Western Command complained that the garrison of over 40 men in Ballymote had only 26 rifles. And again, you get the, the center and the peripheral. This is Richard Mulcahy, who by then was commander-in-chief, complaining to McKeown in the Western Command, personally, I cannot sense that there is any solid administration or organization over the area pressing back the forces of disorder there. So he's blaming McKeown. And the Western Command report back saying, we can't move from our barracks for the reason we have neither transport or ammunition. So there, it's the blame game again. So the IRA columns survived and continued their activity. Government posts in Sligo Town were sniped in mid-October. Ten prisoners escaped from Sligo Jail. There were attempts to repair communications like the Colooney to Clare Morris railway line, repaired in late, late November, but the IRA wrecked it again after that. Drumcliffe Bridge was, had been damaged. It was repaired in September, damaged on the 14th of October, repaired on the 23rd of October, and demolished again on the 28th of October, for example. The arrest of some of Carty's men in Tubbercurry at the beginning of November led to his men shooting dead two locals as spies near the town on the 5th of November. And two men died then in follow-up searches, accidentally, I think, after that. His men also killed two National Army soldiers in an ambush outside Tubbercurry on the 30th of November. By December 1922, the National Army were reporting very pessimistically from Sligo. Every day, the irregulars, the IRA, are strengthening the position and recruiting more men. And they suggested if things stay as they are, we won't be able to wear down the irregulars for at least two years. And as if to confirm this pessimism, Sligo IRA carried out two spectacular operations at this time which earned national publicity and embarrassed the government. In December, they captured the army position in the town hall, killed a soldier, and escaped with 21 rifles, four revolvers, and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition. And then, on the night of 10th of January 1923, they almost completely destroyed Sligo Railway Station in one of the largest acts of destruction in the country during the Civil War and it made national and even international news. There's the, the famous pictures by Kilgannon Kil, um, from his book Sligo and Surroundings of the destruction wrought at Sligo Station. But these, but these actions proved to be the last major offensive actions by Sligo IRA. The National Army structure was rearranged in January 1923 and the Western Command was broken up, and this proved a turning point. The areas north of the Ox Mountains came under Donegal Command. Rest of Sligo under Clare Morris Command, sparked from a small little area. Donegal by then was almost free of IRA activity, so that command could concentrate on Sligo. An IRA report at the end of January said... Since this area has been handed over to the Northern Command under General Sweeney, the enemy has been very active. That's the National Army. They are raiding the country constantly in large bodies. These sweeps in early 1923 saw significant IRA losses, with the arrests of officers in Ballymote, Tubbercurry, and the killing of people like Harry ben ben uh, Brehany in uh, Kulani, that's his memorial card on the right and his memorial in Kulani. And on the left is Patrick Stenson of Curry, who actually was a brother of the Maria Marin we saw earlier. The sweeps of the Arigna area then also meant captures, including the leader there, Ned Bofin. By the end of April, government reports claimed that the IRA columns in Sligo were reduced in strength and their, their, their numbers were lessening. The inclination to ambush or fight is finished. Even at that stage, they still had plenty of weapons and ammunition, and a lot of this was being dumped as their numbers dwindled. But Liam Lynch, who was the, the uh, commander-in-chief of the IRA, complained to Pilkington about this. He said, you should press for more activity. 
If all our forces and active services are properly organised into columns and well led, they should be able to make things very hot for the enemy. He was very annoyed with the fact that the Iran Sligo were reporting they had lots of weapons and ammunition, but they weren't really doing anything. Again, the centre and the periphery at odds. Of course, Liam Lynch died soon after that, 10th of April 1923, and Frank Aiken took over, and he issued an order to dump arms on the 24th of May. Now, Pilkington was, was privy to that order. He disagreed with it, but um, he did enforce it in Sligo. And this is what he said, although the feelings and opinions of all ranks in the division, that's the Third Western Division, were against the decision calling off the war and dumping the arms, still the orders enforcing this decision have been faithfully and effectively carried out. And Clermont's command reported in June, all irregular arms seems to, be, to have been dumped. The end of the Civil War wasn't greeted by any celebrations in Sligo or elsewhere. Neither side had much to celebrate. The general feeling was, of course, relief. The legacy of the Civil War included a large amount of structural damage done in the, in the county and country to buildings and infrastructure, and also the bitterness of a civil conflict. And it's important to note that this wasn't just between the opposing side, Free State and IRA, as seen, for instance, in the Fine Gael, Fine Fall political divide, but it was also between some of those who had been active on the same side. And this was evident in the long-running row among those who had been anti-treaty over the appointment of R.G. Bradshaw, a prominent IRA activist and editor of the Connacht Man, as town clerk in Sligo in the 30s, which included a five-day libel case in 1934 in the High Court. And also the bitterness of the Martin Brennan, Frank Carty rivalry in South Sligo at the 1937 and following election. It also appears in the many disputes and disagreements among the Sligo Old IRA recorded in the online pension records. It is nice, however, to find a document such as this reference of 1935 in the pension records. It's by Jim Hunt, Free State Army, for Frank Carty, IRA leader. Claimants had to provide referees who would vouch for their activity during the whole period, the War of Independence and Civil War. And it was unusual to ask a survivor from the other side. But Carty asked Hunt. And after giving, giving details of Carty's service from before 1916 on to the end of the Civil War, Hunt added, During the Civil War, I was commandant of the National Army. He was the actual leader of Republican forces in the West. He had outclassed and beaten the National Army in the early stages of Civil War. And had he been captured, he would not today be making application for a pension, as he was the most hated and wanted man from Athlone to Ballina. I was a bitter opponent of his. But I give this simple reference in justice to a great soldier and a gifted natural leader. And finally, just afterwards, Liam Pilkington, the OC Third Western Division, he was arrested after the Civil War ended and he spent some time in internment camps. He was a, ordained a redemptorist priest in 1932 in England, not in Ireland. He served in the UK. He served in South Africa from 1939 to 1953. He returned to England. He died in 1977 and he's buried in Liverpool. Frank Carty wasn't captured after the Civil War. He remained in politics. He was a founder member of Fianna Fáil. He remained a Sligo TD until his sudden death in 1942 at the age of 45. He had been called to the bar in 1936 and had married in 1938. So that's it. Just a quick run through the course of the Civil War in Sligo. But behind that rather land outline, there are so many fascinating stories which remain to be researched and told, or some of them have been. And we're lucky that we have speakers who follow me who have researched some of these stories and they're here to share with them, them with us. Gurramil Mayhag of Galair.
Michael, thank you so much for that. And there was definitely nothing bland about that presentation. It really struck me listening to it. All the names are so familiar. I mean, they're all Sligo names that we know. And I think what's wonderful about one of you know, these decade of centenaries events is there that all people from all sides of the, you know, the, whose family would have been on different sides of the Civil War, we can all come together and learn and relearn the history together. And I think that's happening tonight. So thank you for that. I'm going to move on now to our next speaker, and that is Captain Keen Hart. Keen focuses. Yeah, we did that. Keen focuses much of his research on the lives of Countess, County Sligo's military figures, and that could be going back from um, to the Napoleonic Wars right up to the current Defence Forces. Uh, being from Riverstown, he has a passion to uncover stories of I Irish soldiers or Irish people in the Defence Forces. And he researched and wrote The Lost Tales, Riverstown Troubles, 1919-23. And that's what he's going to talk to you about this evening. Keen. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the, the, the wonderful introduction uh, and thanks for all of you for, for being here and uh, the early applause as well. It's always very welcome. Um, what I'd like to say is I'm very conscious of where it is that, that I work. I'm, I'm within the Defence Forces, but I'm even more so conscious of where specifically I work. So I'm currently stationed in Cottlebrew Barracks, Rat Mines, Dublin, within which I work in Michael Collins's old office, essentially, when he was Commander-in-Chief uh, for that very short period of time of the National Forces. So for me, the Civil War and that era, not only is it a, a passion that I, that I love to research and read um, about, but in many respects, uh, having worked in the building, the architecture, that many of the features remain the same, it's a constant reminder and a constant grounding that it wasn't altogether uh, that long ago. Okay, so I researched and wrote this, this very localised history of my own area of Riverstown's actions and events uh, during the, essentially the 1919 to 23 period, some years ago now. But it does, despite all the various avenues that I might be researching uh, since then, definitely remains my most favourite aspect because, of course, it is your local history. Many of the, the names are still pertinent um, and many of the same families live in the local area. So what has and remains fascinating to me, just branching slightly beyond that, is the mindsets of soldiers, volunteers, passive supporters, etc. I love trying to understand motivations and the why of, in this case, why join the National Forces or the Free State Army, why, side on, on, uh, why fight on the side of the anti-treaty forces, why, why maybe be in support of the treaty but not, act, not actually enlist within the Free State. So, there's a lot of uh, various motivations and different strands that, that, I try and, uh, that I try and pursue and try and find uh, answers to. Of course, it's not easy. These individuals are no longer alive. Even their next generation, for the most part, are no longer alive. But that's where wonderful archives and documentations do come into play. So much of what I will say here today will not be overly surprising uh, to those who have an interest, and of course, being here, most of you do so. But like any aspect of history, once we localise national teams, or some of the great national questions of this period, it can enable us all to, to relate that bit more to the period and the characters of the period. So given the short speaking time that I have, in part, I thought it best to highlight within this time frame, not all that there has been uncovered today, and Dr. Farry just alluded to it, but how much more there is to uncover. So I'll then also uh, briefly just show a comparison of, of the forces uh, that faced off against each other within the Sligo area during that time. And then finally, I'll just try and, and emphasize, I think, throughout maybe the, 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 this talk, just the importance of local history, because in many respects, all history is local to, to some respect. Uh, and despite being local, it can still have regional and even national ramifications um, on, on various events. And then before I just get into it, um, whoever came up with the title I think for this conference was, was right on the money, explore, exploration of, of this period. Because again, we know quite a lot, but then when you get into the weeds of certain aspects or events or characters, and in my case, motivations, we don't actually know a lot. And there is a lot of exploration still to, uh, still to be revealed. Okay, so...
the second battalion under the Arigna Brigade, so it was detached from, from Sligo during the Civil War, but that is essentially the, the area of operations. And for those who may be able to read there, you'll see, so you have a, um, just in terms of the military structure, you have a brigade, and then there under, you may have battalions and companies. So for the Riverstown Battalion, you had companies underneath it. You had a Riverstown company, Suey, Glen Conway's Cross, St. James as well, Giva, Highwood, Ballyrush, and I've included Kilcreve in there, even though it was under the Ballymote Battalion uh, chain of command, but there was a lot of interaction and a lot of crossover of volunteers. So, again, my book is essentially a history of that battalion, its members, its activities, uh, and, and the events that happened within that area. And what this local study actually enables me to do is to look at it in a small microcosm. So we, we all generally know the national events. We all generally know, especially after Dr. Farry's wonderful introduction, generally what's, what's happened within the Sligo region. And then I go into the, a bit more <laughs> finer detail of, of uh, a specific area within the county. And again, some of the questions that motivated me, to what degree did the IRA local leader, whether he went anti or pro-treaty, did he bring all the rank and file regular volunteers with him? So to what degree did the leader um, play in, in deciding people's uh, loyalties? Did family loyalty to, to certain individuals play a role? Did IRA volunteers of the 1919-23 period physically join the Free State Army? Did they believe in the treaty so much that they physically enlisted in the National Army? And how did loyalties divide and why in the lead up to the Civil War? Small little tangent on this is it's sometimes dangerous, of course, to extrapolate too much, to make grand overarching conclusions on what is a very localised uh, study of, of a local area. But in many respects, again, I emphasise history is local at its heart, at its root, and some conclusions can be made. Okay, a lot of information on the board there. I'm going to leave it up. Uh, just so you can try and find maybe your local area or some individuals that, that uh, you may be able to relate to. And some of the pictures then accompanying are Free State and anti-treaty IRA volunteers from, from the area. So getting into the actual details. So the vast majority of Riverstown's IRA volunteers during the War of Independence, and especially the officer HQ element uh, of the various companies, sided against the treaty. The entire 5th Battalion Officer Corps, including Tom Dignan, his Vice OC, Adjutant, Quartermaster, etc., all sided against the treaty. And I would say this list is taken from uh, what's essentially described as the IRA membership series file within the military archives, uh, excuse me, up in Dublin. And you can see, if you were to cross-reference these names that's taken on the 1st of July 1922, with who was known to be a leader previous to that in the 1990-21 period, there is massive crossover. As I said, this battalion, not to cross compare with other battalions, but was significant in its wholesale uh, agreement to be anti-treaty. There were very few exceptions to that rule, and I'll just name the few that, that were there. Suey Company, for instance, uh, its leader, Peter Keenan, sided for the treaty, but he did not join the Free State Army. Patrick Cran, the uh, company leader, or the captain of Glen Conway's Cross Company, sided with the treaty, as did Captain Matt Leonard of Riverstown Company. But significantly, once you go into the weeds and once you go into the rank and file membership, these leaders, despite going, against it, despite going for the treaty, not only did they not join the Free State Army, but they could not convince the rank and file members to go with them. For the vast majority, decided against, uh, against the treaty. So during the Civil War, the Riverstown 5th Battalion was released from the command of the Sligo Brigade. It was instead transferred, as I said, to the Arigna Brigade and was reconstituted as the 2nd Riverstown Battalion, 2nd Arigna Brigade, 3rd Western Division. So I won't go into major detail um, because, again, for those of you not from Riverstown, you mightn't find this as captivating as myself. But Riverstown was, as I said, a microcosm of all that was ongoing. So all that was ongoing, not just regionally, but nationally. So you had your dances and your fundraisers for various kinds held in local halls, for the most part to try and gain funds for the anti-treaty IRA. Motor vehicles uh, of those few that were around County Sligo requisitioned, borrowed in, in some respects. Um, absentee landlord homes occupied, used as, as, as training facilities. Uh, training camps, as Dr. Farry alluded to there, were also within the area. 
You also had some young people, the like of Mar Michael Burgess from Commerce Cross, actually sent up to Dublin to train under Countess Markovic uh, with Fina Aaron. Uh, you had Free State Army recruitment drives entering the villages of the areas. And of course, for anyone who, who speaks with knowledgeable locals of any area, you had great debates in churches at the time during mass between priests who were very, very political, especially for some reason in the Riverstown area, um, getting into arguments, for want of a better word, uh, with the anti-treaty elements within, within the service. You also had ambushes, assassinations, etc. So all that was happened nationally, all that was happened regionally, does happen on a local level as well. But I do wish to branch out from this local area to make a few county-wide points. So let us look now at the membership of the anti-treaty IRA versus the Free State Army during the Civil War. Okay, so what you'll see there is essentially County Sligo was not its own homogenous unit. So you had various units that crisscrossed um, and flowed between county boundaries. So if you take it, the first one, you had the first Sligo Brigade, Third Western Division, four battalions, but two, for our purposes here, not overly relevant, Bundorn and Manor Hamilton. However, you have one based out of Sligo Town, Callery, Carroll, Kilmacone, 211 all ranks. Small tangent, 1st of July 1922 is when, it, when, these, uh, when these lists, uh, I beg your pardon, in the early 30s these lists were compiled by ex-members of the anti-treaty uh, IRA. Of course, Fianna Fáil gets into government in the early 30s, and they open the pension process to those who were against the treaty. So what happens was they, they reconstitute the role unit, units get the role leaders together, and they compile a list of those who were active on the anti-treaty side to use as a reference document, essentially, when these guys go and seek a pension for their actions in 1922 to 1923 against, against government forces. So then also, in terms of membership, uh, in terms of units that were active, you have the 4th uh, Brigade, South Sligo, 3rd Western Division, Strength, all ranks, 1543. So you have four battalions again in there as well. One essentially based out of Tubercurry, another out of Colooney, another out of Ballymote, and another out of Gurchin and the extremities of South Sligo. Altogether, 1543 on paper. Of course, not all of these individuals were active. They didn't have the arms, they didn't have the ammunition to actually uh, to, to, to equip all these individuals. Then you have the unit that I, that I studied, 144 all ranks, the Riverstown a battalion that, that fell under a different area. Then you have a very, very interesting one. Um, you have the 5th Battalion, 2nd Brigade, North Mule, 4th Western Division. Now, while this unit is very interesting from a documentation perspective, is it's one of the very few units of this area, it's the only unit in Sligo, probably one of the very few across the country, that when these uh, committees in the early 30s and the old anti-treaty IRA reformed, they actually compiled a list of the 1919 to 1921 period as well as those in 1922. So you can do a direct comparison who was, who was active during the War of Independence, who remained active during the Civil War. And what's very interesting about the figures is that 363 all ranks during the War of Independence, but it, it rises to 434 during, during the, the Civil War. So one would naturally assume it would be cleaved in half, 50-50, pro and against the treaty, but actually their membership rises, which again goes into the motivations of certain areas. Did leaders bring all these people along? Why did this unit actually increase when, for the most, for the majority, other units actually decreased in size? And of course, just to re-emphasize, the numbers sound amazing on paper, 2613 as you see at the bottom, but again, not all of these individuals were, were active. But just as a, as a neat comparison, we've also got the strength of what the Free State was, or the Free State National, or, or the National Forces were uh, during this same period. So again, another fantastic document housed in the military archives is an army census taken over two nights in early November of 1922. And what you have here is essentially is, is a breakdown of who was, who was based where and where they were from. So you have 176 serving in Ballina, covering, of course, West Sligo, uh, Operation Lyria, 50 in Ballymode, 170 in Boyle, covering South Sligo, 19 in Ballasadere, 70 in Tubber Curry, 145 in Mercury Castle, 254 in Sligo Town. So an accumulated strength of the Free State within that area, excluding a kind of a, a rapid mobilisation from the likes of Atlone and other areas like that, a big ratio, seemingly on paper, in favour of the anti-treaty forces. 
But again, as Dr. Ferry alluded to, there was only so many rifles to go around, there was only so much ammunition to go around, that whereas there might be more active volunteers within the anti-treaty IRA, in terms of those equipped and ready to fight, it was more than just a numbers game. The Free State had a huge advantage. Just actually go back once quickly. What's interesting about my local study, and again, I just love motivations and trying to understand figures and, and trying to put the why into, uh, into particular people's mindsets or trying to understand them, is when I studied the 5th Battalion, I, I managed to source most of their volunteers' names. I, I, I gauged who was actually active, who was a passive supporter, who would just you know, not actually pick up an arm and, and engage in various ambushes and military activity. What's interesting about this unit and again, everyone is, is, the material is out there to go and research your own kind of area of operations, your own, your own people's area, is I can only source one individual out of approximately 150 to 170 from the Riverstown 1919 to 1921 period who physically enlisted in the Free State Army. So again, a huge disparity, a huge disparity amongst the rank and file, amongst the HQ as to who sided within my local area for or against the treaty. That one individual, unfortunately, was then not listed on the November census because he'd actually been killed in action. And his name was Lieutenant McDermott from Knockadoo in Riverstown. He was killed outside Mercury Castle uh, by ex-forces. <laughs> um, so just a very interesting, uh, very interesting analysis that when you go into the weeds, you find some very interesting uh, conclusions. Okay. My big conclusion is that there's a huge amount of research still to be, still to be unraveled, still to be delved into. Um, I'd, I'd emphasize, as I did to all the students this morning, that there is such a wealth of information in the military archives now. It's uh, pension applications, for the most part, is, is what I love getting into now, because that's the individual's justification as to why I, as a volunteer, am applying, for the government, applying to the government for a pension. There's a balancing act, of course, when you're reading through these, you may have a, a tendency to exaggerate, so you may get more of a pension. Um, there is, of course, that. You, you need to try and uh, you need to weed out who's actually uh, who's telling the truth for the most part. But you also have, um, you also get the finer detail that you don't get in any other documentation. So Joe Bloggs justifies his pension. So he states explicitly, I was at this ambush. I conducted this operation. I done this, then why I done it, etc. So... As an example, you might know of the Dooney Rock ambush, but do we really know who was all there? Where was I situated? What was I doing, etc.? And that's, that information, that, that motivation within that, that is still yet to be uncovered. So research and explore more is essentially what, what, uh, what point I want to emphasize. And thanks very much for your attention and time. Thank you. Ian, thanks so much for that. And what really struck me was, because it made the microcosm of looking at Riverstown, the difficult personal choices people had to make in those times and then stick by them and the effects of that. And just picking up then on what Keen was saying about doing the research. Do you know the way you've all, we've heard stories from grannies and granddads of happenings. What I love about having sort of the likes of the military archives is I've been able to go and check up the elderly relatives told me. You know the way you always say, I should have listened to what they told me, I should have listened to the story. Like there are digital archives now where we can actually, even if they passed away and can't tell us, we can go and check the stories and check the facts. And you know, see those pension application stuff. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Anyway, you have been packed with information for the last hour. So we're going to give you a break. We're going to have a 15 minute interval. So if I can ask you to come back here in 15 minutes and we'll have our next two speakers. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker today is Dr. Porig Dagnan, historian and published author. His most recent book, Sligo in the 18th Century, is a wonderful glimpse into all aspects of Sligo life in the 1700s. Dr. Dagnan's talk today is The Protestant Community in Sligo, 1914 to 1949, examining how this particular community were impacted with the county in turmoil. Please welcome to the lectern, Dr. Porig Dagnan. If I could just get, there we go. It's just my um, sliders. Now, sorry about that. So, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, I'm delighted to be asked here this evening to speak a little bit about Protestant experiences of the Civil War in Sligo. Um, firstly, I hope to say a little bit about Protestants during the War of Independence. Uh, tax, raids, post-Unionist politics, Rape Peers Association, Sinn Féin Courts and the Government of Ireland Act. Then I'll move on to the main body of the talk, uh, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the truce period, withdrawal of British forces, situation for Protestants and the impact of the subsequent civil war on the community. And then I just conclude with a little piece on the post-revolutionary period, the aftermath, talk a little bit about economics, business, local and national politics, culture and clubs. So at the time, at the start, of the War of Independence, the Protestant community in Sligo numbered 15% of the town's population and 10% of the county's population. It had emerged relatively unscathed from the War of Independence. Uh, the war didn't really not take on a sectarian tone in Sligo, as it had done in many other parts of the country. And the IRA condemned the few isolated attacks against Protestants and on the property of Protestant churches. Now, during the War of Independence, a Protestant civilian had been killed. However, this action was carried out against the wishes of the IRA leadership. Some Protestant farmers had suffered intimidation and Protestant property owners had incurred damages, which in many cases was related to the fact that they had owned property which had been previously occupied by the RIC. Much of the property that was occupied by the RIC was actually rented from Protestant landowners, and that's why they came under attack. Protestant jurors had been kidnapped during the conflict, but they were quickly released unharmed. Now, the large businesses and the landed Protestant families in Sligo emerged relatively unscathed. There were, however, a few incidents involving Protestants, and in February 1920, the IRA raided Temple House for weapons, uh, along with forcing a number of other Protestants to surrender their arms. The vast majority of Protestants in Sligo really did keep their heads down during the conflict and they did their best to avoid any contact with the warring parties. Now, at the beginning of the conflict, the financial troubles of Sligo Corporation provided Protestant and Catholic businessmen with an opportunity of becoming directly involved in local politics through the formation of the Ratepayers Association. And for the first time, many Protestants took an active role in local politics. Now, the success of the Ratepayer candidates in the Sligo Corporation election in January 1919, which was the first held under proportional representation and attracted international attention, was really important in unifying unionists at this time as a split had developed between Ulster Unionism and Irish Unionism. This gave them something to work on locally. 
The IRA had established control over many parts of Sligo and threatened traders who were dealing with the police and told people not to give any information to the authorities. Only a very small number of Protestants did give information to the police and some who did suffered attacks on their property as a result. Now, with the RIC withdrawal from many large areas of the county and a reduction in patrolling, the IRA took over the duties of policing the area and Sinn Féin set up courts to deal with land disputes and regular crime. Just as to see what Protestants themselves thought of these courts and policing, Brian Cooper of Markery House, he praised the fairness of the Sinn Féin courts and the courts showed their impartiality by finding in favour of Protestants who came before them and decided to force many Republicans who had attacked or confiscated any property of Protestants and Protestant churches to pay fines or to return the property. Although some Protestants were still targeted as part of land agitation and they were forced into selling part of their holdings as a result of decisions made by those courts. Now Sligo Protestants in general wanted to keep out of trouble and most wished to keep their views to themselves. However, in September 1920, Protestants in Sligo did speak out against sectarianism in Belfast and Northern Ireland and both Catholic and Protestant congregations in Sligo raised funds to assist Catholics in Belfast who had become unemployed. And although generous in words and in actions, it mu you must be mindful that Sligo Protestants were still motiv motivated by the fear that they themselves could become targets at any time. During the summer of 1920, the Sligo IRA began to attack RIC patrols and in October and November 1920, reprisals by Crown forces in both North and South Sligo were conducted in response to attacks by the IRA units. Now, pro prominent Protestants, the Catholic Church and local and international press strongly condemned the violence. The British counter-terror and heavy-handed tactics by the Crown forces did much to alienate both Protestants and Catholics in Sligo. Um, but when the Government of Ireland Act was passed in 1920, Sligo Unionists had now generally become totally in favour of Irish self-government. However, local Unionists, including Charles O'Connor, uh, Charles O'Hara, sorry, publicly questioned the wisdom of introducing this act while the country was still in disorder. Although they seemed more concerned with local politics at the time, uh, where ironically they were in a much stronger position. Now by the end of January 1921, the Sligo Ratepayers Association was successful in securing a mayoral candidate, uh, John Jinx, which was a big boost for the party. This was an important victory for the Protestant community in Sligo during a difficult period and also augured well for a future where moderate nationalists, Catholics and ex-unionist Protestants could work together and cooperate. Now the number of deaths in Sligo during the War of Independence was low in comparison to some other counties and although some Protestants had suffered intimidation and the destruction of property, the vast majority had survived relatively intact. On 7th of January 1922, the Dáil approved the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and although the Protestant councillors and farmers in Sligo were still Unionist at heart, they were realistic enough to know and to see that the days of the Union were numbered. So they registered their support for the Treaty publicly. They put their support behind the new state and they were determined to resist any narrow perception of nationality. Now the Protestant community in Sligo were concerned by the withdrawal of British forces from Sligo and within a week of the withdrawal some pro prominent Protestant politicians and businessmen were kidnapped although they were quickly released. During the truce period and during the Civil War, some pragmatic and influential Protestants, including Charles O'Hara, were prepared to recognise the authority of local IRA commanders and established a working relationship with them. 
Now, the actions of Protestants and Unionists towards Catholics in Northern Ireland, of course, did not bode well for Protestants and Unionists in the south of Ireland. At the end of March 1922, Protestants met in the largely Unionist Constitutional Hall. The Sligo Constitutional and County Club had their meetings there to register their condemnation of attacks on Catholics in the north and to praise the religious tolerance of their fellow Catholic townspeople. Of course, although true, it must be mindful that the portrayals of respect for their Catholic neighbours in Sligo Town was primarily motivated by the fact that they could become targets themselves for, of Catholic retaliation for all that sectarianism that was being displayed by Protestants in the north of the country. Their fears turn out to be true, and in April 1922, attacks took place on many Protestants around southern Ireland. In the period of April to June 1922, there were some minor robberies of Protestants in Sligo. However, the IRA condemned these actions and forced a, a number to return the property which was stolen. So Sligo didn't take on the same kind of sectarian violence that was very evident in some other parts of the country. During the general election campaign in May and June of 1922, the Sligo Independent, uh, which had been a pro-unionist paper, and many Protestants supported the independent candidates. Now, those candidates and their supporters in Sligo were threatened and hassled by Sinn Féin. But despite the, int the intimidation and the dominance of the Sinn Féin party, many of uh, the independents, they still managed to gain 14% of the vote in the Sligo East Mayo constituency. And this boded well for the future when more unrestricted elections could be held. Now, when the civ civil war broke out, anti-treaty forces in Sligo were in a very strong position and they made some early gains against the unprepared Free State troops, uh, as mentioned by Captain Hart in his talk earlier. Now, most Protestants supported the Free State However, after sacrificing their unionism and accepting the treaty, they feared that the Republican forces would cause more suffering for them. A considerable amount of damage was caused in Sligo during the Civil War, and 52 people were killed, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Farry in his talk. Only one Protestant, however, was killed, and this seemed to be neither sectarian nor politically motivated and was the result of a long-running agrarian dispute. Evidence suggests that only four Protestants from Sligo fought for the IRA during the War of Independence, and they all later took the anti-treaty side during the Civil War. There was also a Protestant Free State soldier who was killed during the Civil War um, he's from Sligo. He was killed during the Civil War elsewhere in Ireland. Um, however, the majority of Protestants in Sligo took absolutely no part in the Civil War, most, of course, supporting the Free State as the best alternative for peace. Now, few Protestants suffered during the Civil War and were never singled out because of their religion, resulting in only a very small number of claims for damages. Most Protestant landowners were not attacked, and the situation, of course, was far worse for Protestants in many other counties around the country. Although some Protestant experiences of the Civil War in Sligo, of course, were not positive, the community had survived relatively intact, and most Protestants were sufficiently confident concerning their future in Sligo and wished to remain on. Now, Protestant traditions were interwoven into the fabric of Sligo society before the revolutionary period. And there had always been a strong history of Protestant investment in both industry and agriculture. They were actively involved in promoting economic activity related to agriculture, and they were instrumental in establishing farming societies and organisations to promote agrarian-related industries. And Protestant landowners in Sligo remained very active in all facets of agricultural and industrial life, in particular after the foundation of the Free State in 1922. Back in the mid-19th century, 
Protestant landowners and businessmen, along with some Catholic businessmen, raised funds to develop and expand Sligo Port, which was the economic engine of the town. However, more Protestants were involved at the time, and they dominated Sligo Harbour Commission, the organisation which was set up to run and promote the port. Now, Arthur Jackson, Harper, Campbell, Perry, and other Protestants served as harbour commissioners from the late 19th century all the way up to the 1940s. After the foundation of the Free State, the Protestant businessmen did not lose interest in the port, and in fact actually took an even greater interest after 1922. They made strenuous efforts to invest capital and help the port remain profitable, especially during the economic downturn of the 1930s. And despite the lack of government assistance, they continued to make efforts to upgrade the port in the late 30s and 40s. Now, Protestant investment in railway building in Sligo in the last part of the 19th century was crucial for the economy of Sligo town and the hinterland. And there was an especially keen interest displayed by both the Gorboot and Wynne families they helped establish an important connection between Sligo and Belfast, which of course was an economic powerhouse at the time, at the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The connection between Sligo and Belfast did suffer after 1922, but this was not due to lack of Protestant interest or investment in the Sligo to Belfast connection, but it was much more to do with the destructive effects of partition. Now, despite the best efforts of Arthur Jackson to turn the Sligo, Leitrim and Northern Counties railway uh, profits around, an achievement which he was partially successful, the line to Enniskillen was closed in 1957. However, Protestant directors and shareholders were involved in the company to the very end. Now, there had been many companies in Sligo that had been established by Protestants uh, and in the 19th and early part of the 20th century. And they continue to operate successfully and provide employment in the 20s, 30s and 40s. And Jocelyn Gorboot's Connacht Manufacturing Company operated until well into the 1920s before closing. However, in the 1930s, Protestant businessmen were willing to invest capital in new enterprises in Sligo, notably the Sligo Shoe Company and although the proportion of Protestant businesses dropped by 11% in the period 1912 to 1931, in the years from 1931 to 1948, Protestant businesses only fell by 2%. There were very, there were very many successful Protestant-owned businesses which provided employment opportunities for both Protestants and Catholics. However, Protestants did occupy many of the higher positions in these firms, uh, such as directorships and the heads of departments, while Catholics filled many of the lower positions. Now, at the beginning of 1923, during the Civil War, Protestant businessmen met to form the Sligo Chamber of Commerce, which demonstrated a strong commitment to the local economy and a willingness to remain in the town in difficult circumstances. This was at the height of the Civil War, which shows their commitment to remaining in Sligo and conducting business in the future. Now, at the very first meeting of the Chamber, the Mayor Dudley Hanley, Sinn Féin, gave this, the Chamber of Commerce his full blessing and support, and he argued that all businessmen should become members. In the early stage, of course, there was only a very small number of Catholic members, but by the 1940s, this had, this had grown. Most of those running Sligo Chamber of Commerce were Protestant, and they did a lot to assist the business community in Sligo during a very difficult period by lobbying the government for more investment in the port and in other industries. This, of course, indicates that the Protestant business community built on the fair treatment by the free state following the, the Civil War and were keen to play a prominent role in the economic life of the town and county. And Protestants augmented their economic concerns by continuing to be involved in local and national politics. Now many uh, politically Protestants, in particular Protestant businessmen in Sligo, 
were very well represented through the Ratepayers Association. And in the period 1919 to 1925, five of the eight ratepayers councillors on Sligo Corporation were Protestant. The, company, uh, the party sorry, continued to be very popular with, uh, with the business community generally. And in the period following the Civil War, many more Catholics began to join the party, which indicated strongly that politics wasn't going to divide along sectarian lines in the town. Now, in fact, the ratepayers proved to be an important organisation in uniting Protestants and Catholics with a common economic purpose outside the pro- and anti-treaty politics of Comine Gael and Sinn Féin. However, the Comine Gael party seemed to broadly represent the interests of the ratepayers and many Protestant members of the ratepayers supported the party and they would have backed Comine Gael candidates in the elections following the Civil War. Now, before the Civil War, the Sligo Independent and Sligo Champion editorials had begun to move more closer together in their opinions, and both papers were supporters of the ratepayers and the Comine Gael party after 1923. Now, in the corporation elections of 1925, both papers backed the ratepayers, and the results of the elections proved to be even more significant than the 1919 election, which first used PR. All 12 candidates of the ratepayers were elected, six Protestant and six Catholic. So they took their seats, and, of course, this augured well for the future of politics in Sligo. Now, Sligo Protestants continue to voice their opinions and actively take a part in the elections, uh, local as well as national. Now, they saw themselves for better or worse as part of the Irish state and proved that Protestants in Sligo did take on their share of responsibilities in the new state and did not simply, as some people have accused them, of lying low, saying nothing and waiting and seeing. Now, of course, in addition, to economic and political involvement, Protestants continue to contribute significantly to cultural life in Sligo. The various Protestant fraternities such as the Constitutional Club, the YMCA and the Freemasons, and in addition to a variety of sporting organisations, provided them not only with a separate heritage, but also as a vehicle to promote integration with fellow Catholic townspeople. And they were really important in absorbing the psychological impact of the seismic changes of the 1920s. Now, some of these organisations proved to be an excellent forum for Protestants and Catholics to mix with each other. Although, of course, some of the traditional Protestant clubs remained dominated by Protestant members, integration between the two communities took place in some of the sporting cultural and fraternal associations, especially in those with, where Protestants and Catholics were from a similar socio-economic background. And thank you for listening. Thanks so much for that, Porrick. Fascinating. Two terms that really struck me was Ulster unionism and national unionism and just sort of the subtle differences there, particularly in the context of minority communities and populations. And we look now at sort of new census figures coming from the north and then we look at all the different new minority communities in Sligo and in Ireland. So it's, you know, a lot of the issues that you spoke about then are, are relevant today and similar and in other contexts. We're going to move on now to our final speaker of the evening, Dr. Marion Dowd from ATU Sligo. Marion is the author of The Archaeology of Caves in Ireland and also was part of the group that recent, just this week, in fact, launched the book called The Six, about the Noble Six that we've mentioned. And that's available in the two main bookshops in Sligo, in Lieber and in Eason's. Um, Marion is a lecturer in prehistoric archaeology at the School of Science at ATU Sligo. And her research focuses on caves and the multiple ways they've been adapted and utilised over the centuries or for the entire duration of the human occupation in Ireland. Today, she's going to talk very specifically about the Tumor Cave in Sligo in the context of the Civil War. Marion.
Thanks. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be here and just like to thank the Library Service for organising this event and for inviting me here. Um, I'm an archaeologist, so a bit of an interloper in a, a history event, uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about a project that we started earlier this year using archaeological approaches to investigate a key site in Sligo's civil war. And just to give you a taste of the, the archaeological landscape and the excavation, I'm just going to show a short two-minute film uh, before the lecture begins. Thank you, James. <laughs> So that hopefully sets the scene for the kind of landscape that we're looking at and the work. Uh, there were three of us in the project, myself and my colleagues Robert Mulrani and James Bonsall. Um, and this project really focused in on a key date uh, in September 1922. So the IRA had their main uh, headquarters in Rahley House, about 12 kilometres north of Sligo Town. Uh, we know from intelligence reports there were about 120 IRA stationed in and around the house at that time. And on the 18th of September 1922, the officer commanding, Billy Pilkington, issued a, an order that they would evacuate the headquarters. So it was a planned evacuation. And he had ordered the men that they would uh, escape up to the mountains and then reassemble at Tumora Cave, at the cave hideout. The cave is 17 kilometres from Rahali House, so it was quite a strenuous walk on upland terrain, and if you have the National Army after you, it's even more strenuous. Uh, the following day, 19th of September, the National Army captured Rahali House, but when they got there, they found it was empty, and they described finding only mattresses and some remnants of food. 20th of September 1922, then a key date in this whole uh, scene, um, and this is where the Republicans are on the mountain, uh, the National Army have pursued them. They arrest between 24 and 30 um, IRA men and put them in prison. Then there are six others that they capture, the six surrender, but they're shot dead on the mountain, and they became known as Sligo's Noble Six. But uh, many people don't realise the cave is known in Sligo as the Noble Six Cave, but actually the Noble Six were never there. Um, if you look at uh, the map here, you've got Rahley House up here, uh, and then you've got Tumora Cave over to the east. Uh, sorry, this isn't working very well. You've got Tumora Cave over here to the east. And the six men were killed at two different locations, uh, Seamus Devins, Brian McNeil, uh, Paddy Carroll and Joseph Banks were killed four kilometres from the cave hideout on the summit of uh, uh, Sleeve Moor or King's Mountain. Harry Benson and Tommy Langan were killed on uh, Ben Wiskin mountain about 4.1 kilometers from the cave hideout. So the Noble Six were heading to the cave that day but they never got there. 34 of their comrades did reach the cave 
and uh, they stay there for up to six weeks. That's what's been passed down in local memory. It was known at the time as the Glencar Hideout. Billy Pilkington and others called it the Glencar Hideout because you can see from the location it overlooked Glencar Lake. It's high up in the Dartree Mountains. So um, this project has had a very short uh, lifespan, really. We came up with the idea in November. The project was funded by ATU Sligo, and the idea was that this would be uh, the university's contribution to civil war studies in Sligo. So there were three, the three very glamorous people there are us, the, the excavation team. And we wanted to excavate the cave and see what we could find using archaeological techniques. Um, very little had been written about the hideout in the historical literature. It had only featured in, in a few publications and never more than three or four sentences. So we wanted to see if we could build on that. And a key part of our work was also speaking to relatives of men that hid there. So we were trying to use a multidisciplinary approach. The cave is very difficult to access, and people who live in the area over the decades have often gone looking for the cave and haven't been able to find it. You need to climb to get up to the entrance. Of course, in 1922, they weren't using health and safety standards and, and helmets and ropes, um, but they were you know, climbing up and down the mountain all of the time. The main reason that it was so difficult to, to see is because they strategically positioned a massive boulder at the cave entrance. And they maneuvered this enormous boulder into place so that if you're in the valley below the cave and you're looking up at the mountainside, you can't see the cave uh, at all. If you're inside the cave, it gives you perfect view over the entire landscape. So it was a very strategic employment of this massive boulder. Uh, and then you can see here, just inside the entrance, you've got that massive boulder there that I was talking about. And just below that, they built a series of stone steps to make it easier to, to come down into the cave. The cave itself is about 18 metres in length, but actually only the outer eight metres were used for occupation. So the living space, we were able to establish from the excavation the living space, and it was quite small, about eight metres by two metres. And to have 34 men hiding or using that very small space for six weeks uh, must have been quite a difficult experience. One of the very interesting aspects that we found was um, this stone wall, a uh, low stone wall that had been constructed in the main living area of the cave. And um, within that area, a mortared floor had been laid down. So this is where they had essentially made up a, a mortared floor, mixed mortar outside the cave, and then laid down this floor. It would be very typical of the kind of mortared floor you would find in any 1920s cottage in rural Ireland. Um, this served a couple of different functions for living in the cave. The first thing is that mortared floor kept the area very clean, so they weren't bringing mud and dirt over the space. It also provided insulation, so if um, people were going to stay there for a long time, it protected them from the dampness rising up uh, from the earthen floor beneath. But we also feel that they probably had mattresses and that they were possibly two single mattresses placed on this mortared floor. The reason that we believe that is we have no evidence for bedding. If they had been using straw or foliage, that would have rotted down and would have left a really clear uh, black layer of sediment. But that wasn't the case. And by looking at the witness statements in the Bureau of Military History, a lot of the dugouts in places like Clare and Cork and Tipperary, they had mattresses. They brought mattresses from houses, put them into the dugouts, and then when the dugout was no longer being used a few years later or months later, they brought the mattress back down to the house again. Um, Interestingly, the space that's occupied by this mortared floor, we measured it and it fits pretty exactly with the space of two mattresses. Um, we also found this series of, of large flat slabs laid on part of the mortared floor. We don't really know what they served, what function they served. They were deliberately placed there. They may have been seating or, you know, used for... for putting the men's feet on, and I'll talk about that later. It was a problem in the cave, um, but they served some particular function. 
We also found evidence of some of the food that they were eating during those six weeks that they were uh, living in the cave. So um, we found the remains of a rabbit. We also know from one of the anecdotes that was passed down that they had rabbit, that they would hunt rabbit or, or rabbits were, were cooked for them by some of the neighbours. And we found the complete skeleton of, of one rabbit in the cave. This tiny little bone here, which will be smaller than your fingernail, is actually a roasted or a burnt chicken bone. So we know that at, on at least one occasion they were eating chicken. Um, we also have fish bones, which, you know, when you're halfway up a mountain in North Sligo is a really unusual find, and our specialists identify those as cod. So we have a range of different food that they're eating there. We also found lots of, of pottery sherds and glass sherds. So we have sherds from two different dishes, and these were large earthenware dishes, uh, and then this kind of jar that you would find normally in the dairy. These dishes and the jar would have been quite old. They were already 50 or 60 years old by the time they were brought up to the cave. And that makes perfect sense. You know, you're not going to, to send up your best china with food for these 34 men. So they were using old vessels. There would have been other vessels that were brought up, other dishes and platters. But again, after the cave had been abandoned, those intact vessels would have been brought back down to the houses. So all that was left behind were fragments of broken dishes and platters. We also had part of a, a green glass bottle. Um, again, this would have been used for bringing tea or milk to the men. And a very nice little find here, probably one of the few pleasures that the men uh, had while they were in the cave was smoking. And we found part of a clay pipe, uh, a little judean pipe there, we know again from uh, one of the stories that was passed down through one of the families that the men were always looking for tea and tobacco. Um, so it's really nice to be able to tie in a piece of archaeology with uh, one of those stories. We also uh, had heard from some of the relatives that the men were not able to light fires in the cave because the smoke would have attracted attention of the National Army. Um, and the cave is quite high up in the mountains, so even a small fire would certainly have, you know, been noticed. Uh, so it was quite unusual then to find two sods of turf in the cave, uh, and both of them had been burnt. And what you're looking at below the two sods are pieces of burnt turf charcoal. Now, we closely examined the walls of the cave, and there was no signs of burning, no signs of a fireplace. So we believe that these sods had been dipped in paraffin, and they were uh, used as kind of a lighting, very basic or rudimentary lamps or lighting uh, in the cave. We were able to download the weather reports for September 1922, and the weather was really, really horrible for, for uh, most of the end of September and all of October. Uh, on one occasion, while the men were there, temperatures would have reached minus five degrees. So very, very cold, very dark, uh, and to be in this dark and small space for such a long period, some basic lighting would have been uh, appreciated, I imagine. We also found these fragments of a three-legged skillet pot. This is uh, just an example of what a three-legged skillet pot looks like, but I think we all know what they look like. We all have one of them, or our granny had one of them. Um, and we found one fragmented. These four pieces here have undergone archaeological conservation, and the other two pieces were how we found them. They haven't been conserved yet. Uh, some parts of the skillet pot were found outside the cave and some parts were found inside. This is a very, very heavy implement and, you know, bringing it way up the mountain into a cave doesn't make any sense in the do normal domestic um, function that these would have fulfilled. And we're pretty sure now that this was their toilet, this was the portable toilet, and that the skillet pot was... Uh, held deeper in the cave and that the men would use that and then maybe once a day or at night time empty the pot outside the cave. Certainly there is no scenario possible where 34 men were coming in and out of the cave regularly during the day, especially in the first kind of seven to ten days after they left Rahali House because the National Army were combing the mountain. 
Uh, and again, you have to remember that it's on, the cave is on this very steep slope. So if you had people in and out quite regularly, they would have left a very obvious track and, and led the army to the cave. So this is what we think um, functioned as the toilet. We also had one of uh, my colleagues in ATU, Professor John Casella, forensic specialist. He came in and examined the cave and didn't find any forensic evidence of biological materials. So the space itself was kept very, very clean. Uh, certainly you wouldn't have any kind of um, area that would have been used as a, a live lavatory, let's say. So some of the, the more mysterious finds, which is quite interesting because I suppose often when we think about archaeology, we think it's very much about the distant past and when we think about archaeology in the context of a site that's only 100 years old, we imagine that we will understand everything uh, that is found. So we had a few uh, unusual ones. This is one of them. Um, I originally thought that it was a shoelace, uh, similar kind of dimensions. But what you're basically looking at here are braids of copper wire that have been twisted, and then at one end you have a loop and then there was a cotton textile sleeve over that. So we've sent these pictures to basically every military person, every military museum that we can find in Ireland and Britain. And there are four different theories uh, or suggestions that have come back to us about what this object, which is now fragmented, may have come from. The first one is that it may be from a field phone or a signaling device, and there is uh, an echo of a story that we've heard that there was some kind of communication between the officer commanding Billy Pilkington when he was in the cave and um, another IRA leader outside. The second suggestion is that it may have been part of an incendiary device uh, that would have been attached to a detonator, or sorry, attached a detonator to a box of explosives. Um, the winning theory so far, and, and a number of people have suggested, that it's actually a pull-through for cleaning a rifle. So one of the common rifles that would have been used by the IRA during the War of Independence and Civil War was the Lee Enfield rifle, and that something like this would have been used for clearing or cleaning the barrel of the rifle. Um, so that that's, uh, seems to be the most likely suggestion. Another possibility is that it's an ignition wire for starting a car. Other mysterious objects, or objects that we're not quite sure how to interpret yet, are a series of 17 copper rivets. They're really high quality rivets. Uh, the black material here is iron. Again, it's been conserved, so that's what gives it that kind of glossy, almost plastic-like appearance. Um, so these rivets attach an iron band to something that has now decayed. So maybe something leather, or something wooden, or cardboard. Again, we have a few different suggestions uh, for what these might relate to. They might be from a first aid box or a medical kit box. Now, I think this is quite likely because this cave um, was very well prepared prior to September 1922, probably during the truce period. Um, it had been used in the War of Independence, and it seems that in the War of Independence it was used more for storing arms and ammunition. Uh, but a lot of work went into constructing the mortared floor, uh, creating the little wall, building the stone steps. And if it was being kitted out with the idea that it may be needed for long-term hideout or long-term usage, then they almost certainly would have a medical supply box or first aid box on site. Um, if we look at examples of first aid boxes from this period, from Ireland or Britain, they're often made of very thick cardboard, which again would fit that the cardboard hasn't survived, just the rivets and the straps. Uh, another suggestion is that it's part of an improvised explosives device. Uh, the rivets may also have been from a wooden chest or a crate of some kind that hasn't survived. And uh, another, just, just throughout all possibilities, another is that it may be part of the sheeting from an armoured car. Now, the rivets look much smaller, and of course we know the Ballinalee armoured car was roaming around North Sligo for a while. Um, so it's possible that a sheet of that or another armoured car was brought up to the cave for some purpose. We're just not sure. 
Uh, when we got to the cave first, you know, we were hoping that we would find initials and lots of nice things carved into the cave walls, and we didn't. And of course, that was a very naive expectation, because the men who were hiding there would have had more sense and would not... Um, you know, leave their initials on the walls in, so that they could be later identified. And at first glance, you know, the first few times we were in the cave, it looked like we couldn't see anything uh, carved or any markings. Uh, but then we started using photogrammetry, and this work is still uh, underway at present, but we have found graffiti on one of the rocks inside the cave. Um, it's a series of abstract lines, a little bit like an X's and O's grid, and a series of regular straight lines. One suggestion that's been put forward is that some of those lines may be bayonet sharpening lines, um, but others are probably just somebody sitting on the floor, they're really, really bored, and, and they're scratching at the, the soft calcite on that rock. But again, it's a fantastic kind of discovery because it just puts the people into the site, into the cave. So, um, the story that has been passed down is that 34 men hid in Tormora Cave for six weeks in September and October 1922. We've been able to identify five men who definitely stayed there. We have another three who are very likely to have been there, and we haven't been able to identify any of the others. The main reason for that is that people simply didn't speak about the experience afterwards. You know, we know from all the literature that's out there that the Civil War was something that people weren't comfortable talking about. It was okay to talk about the War of Independence, but the Civil War was kind of a taboo subject. And then a place like this that was so closely linked to a difficult part of Sligo's Civil War it just seems to have been completely off the cards in terms of, of things that could be spoken about. So there were a lot more men than we know of who stayed there. Um, these are four of the men. Uh, Paddy Branley was 32 years old when he was there. He and his brother Dominic, his younger brother Dominic, were there. And the Branleys were a key family in the whole story of the cave. They had the house closest to the cave, and their house was a safe house during the War of Independence and the Civil War. And it's likely that it was Paddy or Dominic who initially discovered the cave, realized its potential, and would have then been working with Billy Pilkington to prepare it as a, a hideout. We also have Tom Daly. I love this photograph on his bike. It, it just really gives a sense of you know, the, the youthfulness and, and vigour of uh, a lot of these men who were involved in the conflict at that time. Um, Tom Daly also stayed in the cave. He was from Balik in County Fermanagh. This uh, next man is Jack Trooper McHugh. And uh, he was a very close friend of Harry Benson, one of the Noble Six. And it was several weeks into his stay in Tormora Cave before he found out that his, his friend, his close friend, had been killed on the mountain. Um, and then the officer commanding Billy Pilkington. Billy Pilkington is an incredible figure and it's such a shame that there's nowhere in Sligo where he is commemorated, there's no road named after him, no memorial plaque. He really was such a huge figure in Sligo Town, North Sligo, during uh, the War of Independence and Civil War. He was only 28 when he was uh, officer commanding, uh, he had also had very senior role in the War of Independence in Sligo. An incredible military strategist, very, very intelligent man, and very, very highly respected by all of the men. Uh, apparently, he never allowed the men drink, use bad language, or uh, smoke. So most of us here would not uh, make the cut for Billy's, um, Billy's army. Uh, he was also key in, you know, we have to think about it. it's a very, very small space, 34 men, they, there was very little movement or ability to move, they couldn't have left the cave very much. So he had a very important role in keeping up morale, keeping some level of, um, you know, camaraderie in the cave. They had just, you know, heard or they were hearing as they were staying in the cave about six of their friends and comrades having been killed that must have raised enormous anxiety because they knew that if they were discovered, if the cave was discovered, they would probably meet a similar fate. They wouldn't necessarily be going to prison. Um, so I think he had a, a key role. 
Uh, one of the other interesting things is that he had broken his shoulder bone on the trip between Rahali House and Tormor Cave, either his clavicle or scapula. So while he was in the cave for these six weeks, he was nursing a broken shoulder. He was a very religious man, and as Michael mentioned earlier, he went on to become a redemptorist priest. So I think we can safely assume that there were a lot of rosaries said in the cave to pass the time as much as anything else. Um, one of the, the aspects I think that we often forget with guerrilla warfare is the massive support infrastructure that's needed um, to support men on the run. Um, and we tend to, to overlook that. We tend to focus on the political activists, whether they're male or female. But none of those activists could actually you know, be involved in guerrilla warfare if they didn't have enormous community and family support. And the people who were involved in providing that community and family support were typically women, uh, not exclusively, but a large percentage were women. And they faced incredible risks if they were caught by the National Army. Uh, we know the terrible atrocities that were committed on women um, during uh, the revolutionary period. Um, so they were incredibly uh, brave making those decisions to help um, men on the run. We've identified at least three women who were involved in helping the men who were hiding in Tormora Cave. This is Sarah Branley, mother of um, Dominic and Paddy Branley, and a really, really incredible woman. Her husband had died before the War of Independence, and she lived in Tormor near the cave, um, and she was very much a, a strong figure. Two of her sons were actively involved in the IRA, her, some of her other children were not. Um, but I think they very much had her support. We know from some of the anecdotes that were passed down that she looked after the men on one very particularly bad night. They came down from the cave and she roasted a lamb for them. Um, she also tended to their feet. Trench foot was the major problem that the men had in the cave. The cave is dry, but it's also damp. So you've no fire, no heating, nothing, no way of drying your clothes. Their feet and clothes were completely sodden. And this, again, has passed down in family memory um, how bad their feet were, the condition of their feet from being in such a damp space for so long. So she tended to the men's feet on the very rare occasions that they were able to come down to her house. The next woman, Maggie O'Connor, um, took food and drink to the men regularly. Apparently about 3 a.m. every night she went up to the, the cave. She probably didn't go to the cave itself. We can be almost certain that food and messages and supplies were brought along the valley and left um, at a particular place. Um, the men would not have you know, revealed to even their closest family members um, where the cave was exactly located because then it put everybody in jeopardy. Um, so Maggie was one of the people who brought food uh, very close to the cave. She also had ulterior motives. She ended up marrying uh, Paddy Branley three months after he left the cave. So she, you know, also had extra anxieties. You know, she was... Um, uh, her fiancé was in this cave, and, and, you know, that must have also generated a lot of worry for her. Then we have Bridget Pilkington, um, who lived in Sligo Town. Her husband was Joseph Pilkington, a brother of Billy. Uh, Joseph was arrested by the National Army after the evacuation of Rahali House, um, but Billy had got to the cave, his brother. So Bridget uh, would leave Sligo Town regularly with some other women, and they would get a donkey and cart to Rathcormac Church, with bringing with them food and tea and tobacco and drink, uh, as in uh, non-alcoholic drink, and uh, leave it in ha with houses or safe houses in the Glencarra Valley. So there was a huge coordinated effort. We also heard just this week that um, some men used to cross Loch Gill by boat from uh, Sligo Town, bringing food um, to Glencar. So um, what I hope that our project has demonstrated is the value of using a kind of multidisciplinary approach. Uh, this is the first time in Ireland that an, uh, 
an archaeological excavation has taken place of any civil war site. So it's really groundbreaking on lots of, of different levels. And I hope that what we're demonstrating with the project is, you know, the, the different information archaeology can contribute or using archaeological approaches. Somebody said to me recently that archaeology is kind of democratic. You know, it's, the pottery was used by everybody, not just the OC. It was used by everybody. The food was eaten by everybody. So we're collecting this information, and it's giving... Personally, I think a more human understanding of, you know, one particular place in the landscape, but it will hopefully encourage other archaeological excavations of Civil War sites. It, the cave also presents a really important insight into guerrilla warfare. We often forget when we're reading accounts of the War of Independence and Civil War how much time was spent on the run and going from safe house to safe house and how difficult that experience was. And we often focus in on the major actions or events, but actually a huge amount of time spent by Republicans was on the run. Uh, and I think that, you know, trying to understand a site like Tormor Cave really gives us that insight into the harshness um, how cold it was, how, you know, desperate it was in, in many ways, and, and probably a very traumatic experience for many of the people who stayed there. Um, Michael Farry mentioned earlier that 52 people uh, were killed in Sligo during the Civil War, and I'm very confident that were it not for Turmora Cave, that uh, number of fatalities would have been much, much higher. And again, what we're seeing here is uh, the astuteness of Billy Pilkington as a leader. Um, I mentioned that it was 17 kilometers from Rahali House to Turmora Cave. There were several other caves and hideouts in the mountains in between those two places. But I think that Billy Pilkington just didn't feel confident that they would have, you know, hidden the men for such a long period when they were under, you know, hot pursuit by the National Army. So he made a very wise decision. And the men were never found, you know, the, the National Army were combing the mountains, they didn't find them, they stayed there for six weeks, and then towards the end of October, they left the cave. We know that they were following, or one of the stories is that they used the the wires from the Barieties mines to kind of lead them back down the mountain onto the road north of Glencar, and, and then they dispersed. Um, it's one of the few intact sites from Sligo's uh, Civil War period. We, we often tend to think that, well, it was only 100 years ago, most of the places are still there. But from our work on the Noble Six in particular, you start to realise that the houses, the buildings, so much has been lost and destroyed. So many papers and mementos and personal objects have been lost or destroyed. So um, this cave is fantastic because it really is like a time capsule. You're literally walking into a space that has hardly been visited since 1922. And a key person in that is Chris Branley. So he was one of the sons of Paddy Branley and Maggie O'Connor. And Chris was very familiar with the valley, um, but he had always been trying to find the cave, and his father was dead at this stage. But Billy Pilkington, who went on to become a redemptorist priest, came back uh, to Sligo, went to visit the cave in the 30s or 40s, and brought Chris Branley with him. And Chris was there for, thereafter the keeper of the cave. It was he who kind of kept the memory of the cave alive and where it was located. Um, and if it wasn't for him, I think the cave would be completely lost to all of us. So he had a, a, a very important role. He's since passed away. The cave was rarely spoken about after 1922. It, it just kind of disappeared from, from consciousness. Uh, probably also because the men who had hidden there didn't reveal its location. It had been kept secret all the way through the War of Independence, all the way through the Civil War. It had served a really important function, so they would have, have remained very secret about it afterwards. So um, I'll just finish up by saying that I hope I've convinced everyone in the audience of how important archaeology can be to studies like this and to say a thank you to all of the different people, um, to ATU Sligo in particular, for, um, 
funding the project and you see some of the, the contributors and specialists who were involved. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Dr. Marion Dowd for, I think you'll agree, a fascinating talk. Uh, a wonderful synergy of archaeology, sociology, politics and history, both local and national. Cahirlach, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. I think you'll agree it was a really enlightening evening. If you'd like to investigate further, you'll be more than welcome into the local studies and archives on Bridge Street. We're currently running an exhibition ourselves on the Civil War in Sligo using Ty Kilgannon's photographs and material from our archive to shine a light on B. Kilgannon, Tyg's niece, and her young comrades in arms and their experience of the Civil War. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Dr. Michael Farry, Captain Kean Hart, Dr. Marion Dowd, and Dr. Porig Dagnan. We'd also like to thank the staff of the Hawkswell and the redoubtable James from Studio Rove. And last but certainly not least, my colleague, Mr. Pat Gannon, for organising the event this evening. Thank you and good night.